welcome to oh, hey great shot this is the great shot podcast a crack racket and tennis channel podcast network production my name is alex gruskin on today's show we have our second edition of our inaugural episode of the deciding point our weekly breakdown of Everything that happens in the Division I college tennis world, of course, this season here, Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern time on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel. We will be breaking down each and every week of the Division I men's college tennis season. Of course, this weekend, we have what we refer to as the ceremonial start of the 2023 college tennis season. It's ITA kickoff weekend time. Joining me to break down each of the 15 regionals we'll see happening across the country and the man who will join me hopefully each and every week on this show throughout the course of the season is a man you know best as the forefather of the college tennis ranks formula predictions never far from the listed UTR. One of the many dames to roots for the Liberty Flames, the professor and of late the lean mean vegan machine it's our dear friend chris helioris chris hey great shot episode number one of the season i believe this is our fourth year now of doing these podcasts together we are potty trained as a show how are you feeling my friend Ah, I'm feeling great. We're getting going. I mean, I get to see your smiling face every week now. I mean, come on. And my 10 year shout out my 10 year old granddaughter, Cameron. I love you, babe. She's watching. She texted me first time ever. Anyone in my family says, send me the link. I want to watch. Come on. <laughs> well, I love that we've now been doing this show so long that your granddaughter is now old enough to watch this show <laughs> on her own. And the good news is that'll keep best of us on our both behavior, knowing that she is tuning in. And hello to her. Hello to all of you joining us on the live feed. I see Scotty B joining us. Of course, anyone who is tuning in, feel free to throw comments, questions our way throughout the course of today show but Chris we kick off the season with a look at the ITA kickoff weekend 15 of the best teams in the country all hosting three other teams as we try to figure out who will make it to Chicago who will be the 16 teams competing for the ITA national indoor championship of course before we get to our breakdown of all the regions it's been four years We've been working on this for a long time. We are so excited here at Crack Rackets to be able to bring you so much of the action that's going to be happening throughout the course of this ITA kickoff weekend. Guess how many regions, Chris, we have on our Crack Rackets broadcast this weekend? Of the 15, I'm going to say we've got uh, 30. Oh, there are there are 30, oh, 30 oh, total. 30 total. Okay. You're so we want men's and women. I'm going to go. 22. That's very generous of you. 18 still. We have uh, 18 regions. And I want to be clear. We'd have all 30. Unfortunately, there are still some TV rights we have to get around. A shout out to A, Dalton Thieneman, who has a real job. And yet, I don't know if he slept in the past month. He's worked so hard for this to happen. 18 regions will be bringing you Friday through Monday. A massive shout out to just about every coach who's hosting a region here this weekend. Everyone made an effort. I'm immensely grateful to that fact. I think college tennis fans will be as well. 18 regions of action. It starts on Friday. We go through Monday. Chris, you want to know how long we've been doing the show yeah, in our first yet. edition of the podcast, we, of course, were covering Will Blumberg, the UNC Tar Heels. I happened to be there in Illinois when his team captured the national indoor title in Champaign. He, we are now old enough that he will be joining me on the broadcast throughout the course of the weekend. One of a couple fun guests we have planned. Do you feel bad, Chris, that I've usurped you or that you've been usurped by Will Blumberg? Ah, uh, come on. I love Will. I mean, if, if if you if you told me it was somebody that I wasn't all that fond of, maybe. But I mean, <laughs> when I can't beat Will in anything, so whatever. Yeah. What have you done 10 times at an all level? 10 time vegan pancake maker, Chris <laughs> Halioris. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I can't. I can't do it. Yeah. No. Yeah, I'm excited to be joined by him. And again, so many fun guests. We'll have that Friday through Monday. Of course, before we get there, all of you are wondering who's going to be competing. What should you be looking for? I got to give a massive shout out to a couple of people who allow us to preview these things. And by the way, will be supporting us all year long here on this show.
show. First of all, Chris, while I talk our fans through what they're missing out, you missed out yesterday on my fantastic collared shirt brought to us via our friends at LS. What I want you to do while I talk, go pull up yesterday's video. And by the way, it's an excuse to force Chris to watch some content that our dear friend John Parsons and I make. But they they have created this collared shirt that I guarantee you, Chris, after you see it, you are about to say, where can I get one? Because you will wear it on every bike ride you go on for the remainder of your lives. It's beautifully designed it's extraordinarily light material and again you're going to see ls starting to pop up everywhere be on the lookout for that we are so excited to have them as a part of our team here on these deciding point episodes this season also of course a massive thank you to our returning sponsors our friends at the swing vision app who are at the forefront of all artificial intelligence innovation technologies happening within our beloved sport of tennis simply put the most efficient way to get better in today's game download the swing vision app today let their technology work for you learn more by clicking on the link in the description to this episode make sure you use our promo code crack 20 when you do sign up to let them know we sent you there chris have you had time to see the shirt what is your reaction i'm i don't know just gruskin in a collared shirt i mean (laughs) what what kind of reaction could you expect other than wow i mean yeah, I'm, I mean, you look good. You look good. I'm devastated because that was Jay's exact reaction as well. It was, oh, my God, I don't think I've ever seen you in a collar shirt. And now I'm starting to regret how I dress because after a year of wearing a lifetime of wearing uniforms to school, let's just say if you saw the bottom half, it would be sweatpants all the time here on this Zoom. Um, Yeah, I guess, you know, again, courtesy, I, I look good in the LS gear, so I feel comfortable wearing it. Shout out to them. Shout out to our friends at Swing Vision. With that said, Chris, 15 regions here on the men's side for us to break down. So much fantastic college tennis for us to discuss before we get into any specific region. Here's my opening question for you. All off season long, we talked about the depth that we think will define this 2023 college tennis season. Obviously, it's always worth the early disclaimer. It took me seven minutes to get there yesterday. It takes me eight minutes to get there today. We still have that extra year, that extra class of eligibility, given what happened during the 2020 season due to COVID. As such, once again, you're going to just have to be a little bit better if you want to compete at the top of college tennis teams one through nine stacked as they have ever been the depth you see through teams not only 25 but honestly 40 60 80 the depth is everywhere with that in mind here's my opening question to you chris helioris over under 11 and a half of our 15 host teams 11 and a half make it to the kickoff weekend because i think that's a testament to the depth that it feels like three host seeds getting upset that doesn't feel impossible Oh, sorry, yeah, Alex. I I was going to come at it for the exact same point, but from the opposite side and say, I think I, you know, I went through the fifteen regions on the men's side to me, and I've only got six locks. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever had a number that small. Uh, you know, usually it's like oh, I've got ten or eleven locks, and maybe three or four teams, or you know, or, or maybe five at the most could get upset. I've only got six locks. That means there's nine possibilities for for upsets. So, yeah, I don't know. If you're going to make me bet on 11 and a half, I, I've got to take the over and say that 12 or twelve host teams get through three upsets. But, ah, uh, geez, I, it's not surprising at all. It wouldn't shock me at all if only nine or ten did. I mean, no. you're absolutely right. I mean, to your point, and we talked about this on the women's side as well, Six locks is infinitesimal compared to some of the things we've seen in past years. And look, of course, there's graduations every season. If there's ultimately three upsets, that's not that drastically different to the trends we've seen historically. That said, to, as you point out, have nine regions, you feel like 
if there's an upset, we're not going to feel the need to record an emergency podcast that Tuesday because they happen, that there are nine regions where it feels like things are in play. That's a testament to the depth. Things are going to get funky. That said, let's start things out with the locks, because as you alluded to, we have six of them here on uh, here coming into kickoff weekend. And for the record, what we want to do on today's preview, we're going to break down all of these host sites. We're going to talk about the top seeds. We're going to talk about who their biggest challengers are, who in the region has NCAA chances. We'll look at some lineup things, of course, as well. Uh, but again, let's start with the locks. Let's start with the defending NCAA champions, the University of Virginia. Now, of course, this Virginia team got off to a slow start last season. They lost five consecutive matches before not losing for the remainder of the year. And look, this UVA team justifiably as such enters as the number one team in the country. They brought back their core five. Rodesh is back. Montez is back. Von der Schulenberg is back. Gets is back. Botzer is back. They have some options to fill in that number six spot as well. Of course, they earned a very impressive 4-0 victory over a top 16 team in Baylor at home over the course of the past weekend. You look for this Virginia team. Nevada is who they will face first. Then they'll play the winner of Old Miss and Princeton. What is it about this UVA team you're looking forward to seeing most this weekend? A challenge? <laughs> okay. I, I mean, seriously, I well, don't I think know. that's unfair right away, and we'll talk about it more when we get to Baylor. But don't, like, 4-0 is a little misleading. They were better matches, you know, 7-6 oh, decided yeah, no, the I doubles did, rubber. I, yeah, I did. Yeah, just just to make sure that was not a slide. I wasn't even thinking for the Baylor at all. Yeah, I could see how it could be taken that way. No, I meant, like, I just don't see them, the three other teams in their region – I just don't see a serious challenge coming from anybody. I mean, there's a couple teams that have a some some a couple talented guys up top, but nobody with the depth that can come close to really putting up a fight. Could they lose a point? Sure, they could. I, they probably won't even lose one, but they could lose a point here or there. But they're not going to get challenged. This is a, they're going to completely walk through here. And yeah, I don't I don't know that I'm looking for a lot from them just because I expect it to be to you know too easy. No coach is ever going to admit that, you know, they're always going to give you the standard line, but no, look, this, they're going to walk through this region. Well, they might get a few good matches up top. Rodesh could get a match on, on, on the second day, you know, but outside of that, I I think the best thing that Virginia is going to get out of this weekend is some good doubles. Uh, You know, that that's where they can do some good work. They're not going to lose a lot of singles matches. So some good doubles work will be good for them. They've brought back Bar and, uh, excuse me, Botzer. I call him Bar because we know him a little bit here on this show. They brought back Botzer and Rodesh to play that number one double spot. They were solid last year. You can understand the inclination there from Coach Pedroso. Look, I like Ole Miss's top four. We've seen Slavic. We've seen Lithin. We've seen Junk and Inglehart. Who's going to be five and six? That's the question. And if you're going to beat Virginia, you feel like it starts, all due respect, at those five and six spots, particularly early in the season. And I don't know if Ole Miss has the answers there. I also, as much as you like their top four, Virginia's is the the Gucci brand version, I suppose, of the top four there. Let me ask you this, because this is how I this is the improvement I want to make from yesterday's show. Sorry to Jay that you don't get the improved me of the other three teams, Ole Miss, Princeton, Nevada. Give me their NCAA chances. In particular, this Princeton team, there are some names I like. Now, Columbia and Harvard are really freaking good this year. I will never sleep on a Rich Bonfiglio coach team, and he is now the head coach at Penn. So will he... <laughs> Is he the new Bresky? Some scholars are arguing maybe. Um, But like NCAA power rank these other three teams for me. Well, I I mean, Nevada is always going to have a good shot conference wise, but, you know, not in in terms of where are they going? Yeah, they have a good shot to make the tournament. Ole Miss, I mean, any SEC team uh, clearly is going to have a good shot. The SEC is generally going to run nine ish, maybe 10 uh, you know, 10 deep in terms of getting in the tourney. So if you put yourself not in 
uh, you know, the bottom two or three in the SEC, really good shot to make the tourney if that's what we're talking about. And Princeton, yeah, Princeton's got, like you said, they got a couple good names that, you know, at the top of the lineup, they've got some good names uh, there now. And and they're going to get to play. Yes, obviously, they're not, you know, on paper, they're not going to be the Harvard and Columbia uh, you know, brand and and at that level, but they're going to get plenty of opportunity. You know, Bonfiglio is going to make some things happen at Penn. They're going to get opportunities to play other really good Ivy League teams. It's It can't be bad for them. Princeton always seems to have something going on. I'm not, I'm absolutely, I wouldn't sleep on them. I, it would not shock me, especially with you know, Princeton's clearly not going to get the Ivy League. Uh, they're not. They're not going to get that automatic bid. But they should make the tournament. Old Miss should make the tournament. Nevada, if they win their conference, they make the tournament. These all these could be four NCAA tournament teams very easily. Princeton losses to DePaul at Wisconsin so far. They still have NC State, Penn State, Middle Tennessee, Vanderbilt on the schedule. Indiana Northwestern as well, and. You know, again, the whole Ivy League to play with. So plenty of low hanging fruit there. I'll tell you what, you know who would love, love to see Princeton in the tournament? Wisconsin, because that would certainly help them after their early season win. And look, the Big Ten could use some rankings help right now. If you look at the early season results, uh, again, Virginia doubles. Who's playing six? That what that's what we're looking for. That said, prediction, who who advances? Who what's the final? I, yeah, I mean, Vir- Virginia is going through the, the, you know, they win. I'm going to say that they play Ole Miss. They play Ole Miss in the final. They take Ole Miss 4-0. Uh, M- Ole Miss m- might get a point. There might be some ke- competitive matches in there, but too many opportunities for Virginia to just put up quick wins. And, and in the matches that are grinds, taking any of those guys out in straight sets will be tough. So, I kind of look at it like even in matches that that can be competitive, they probably go three and don't finish, and Virginia gets out 4-0. Yeah, all right. That's fair. And again, Chris is going to be making the predictions because we're going to be calling some of the matches. I'm going to refrain from doing so. But uh, again, I'll make that over-under upsets-wise prediction at the end of the show. See what you have or haven't talked me into. Um, All right. Let's move on to our next team, the Ohio State Buckeyes. Ohio State, the number two ranked team in the country right now. They play host to Central Florida in their first match, the other regional match there, Tulsa and Oregon. Of course, this Buckeye team has been a staple of national indoor success for all of the 21st century since the, you know, Ty got the job. Uh, Obviously this Buckeye team has captured two national indoor titles. The last time we were in Chicago, who won the national indoors, it was the Buckeyes back in 2019. And, you know, again, have they had the significant, you know, run of the Ty Tucker schedule? No, not yet. Although they did beat Illinois six, one, they've got plenty of stuff coming up before the national indoors begin, but I've been looking at the roster for this team, Chris Moore, and it's the combination of depth and experience. It's like, you know, again, Cannon's played big matches. Boulay's played big matches. Trotter's played big matches. Tracy's played big matches. uh, Cash has played big matches. Luchonic's played big matches now. Anthrop was in the system for a full year as a redshirt. And we haven't even mentioned Alex Bernard. And like you look at their early season results, they played Boulay at one, which certainly caught all of our attention. But that roster, like wherever Bernard slides in, if it's him at three, Tracy four, vice versa, you feel pretty good there. They have options, doubles, singles, things to play around with. What are you looking for most out of the Buckeyes this weekend? Yeah, I mean, obviously, everyone's going to be uh, interested to see to see lineup decisions. And and the only thing that's really of interest to me in the lineup, look, I don't care if you play Boulay one, Cannon two, Cannon, Cannon one, Boulay two. That, that's not the interesting part to me. The interesting part is where do they slide the freshmen in and do both freshmen play? Uh, I, and those freshmen, by the way, redshirt freshman, Jack Anthrop, freshman, freshman, true freshman. That's what that's called. Uh, true freshman, Alex Bernard. Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, honestly, I think indoors is the best opportunity for them not to both play. 
because you can't dislike playing Robbie Cash indoors, you know, and and if you're or Luchonic, have you or seen Luchonic. him connect yeah, with the, the guys ball? like 12 feet tall and, and 280 pounds? His, yeah, stuff. his default I mean, Meyer per hour is 127. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes that means back fence as he and his family know, but a lot of the times of late, that means winners. Yeah. So I, I so when you take the combination of, yeah, Cash and Lichonic, both guys that that should fare really well indoors, this should be a fairly comfortable, we're calling it a lock. So obviously we feel like a very comfortable region for them, opportunity to get some guys some playing time probably a good spot for them to not play both of the freshmen. But at the same time, you want to get your freshmen a lot of playing time to get them into the system and feel what it's like. So it will be interesting to see how, how Ty takes it. My my guess would be we probably see them both in one match and maybe only one of them in another, just to let someone else get some playing time. And of course we know Robbie's playing doubles no matter what, but uh, so he's going to get his time, but yeah, that's the interesting part to me. I, I don't think it should be get should be a lot of push. Although I will say the opening day match for them at one singles, I'm a little interested to watch that one because UCF's got a guy now who's got some, you know, who's got some creds behind him. That will be interesting to see how, how they handle that. But again, you know, you're indoors in Columbus. Nobody wins there. So so it's it's gonna be a tough going for everybody. I couldn't disagree with you more about the freshmen. You get the chance to play them kickoff weekend indoors in the Ty Tucker Tennis Center. That's your welcome to college tennis moment. You have to take it. And like, if you want to play Cash or Luchonic, fine. Pull one of Tracy or Trotter, Upuleg or Cannon, who you have no questions about. Yeah, and that could ha- you're right. That could yeah, happen. And I'm giving the freshmen the reps this weekend because, again, I know what I have in the horses on my roster. You mentioned UCF. Dimmy at the top is interesting. How about Charlton Van de Castile as a one, two for Oregon? I kind of like that. And I'm, I'm getting intrigued by that Tulsa match. Again, power rank by certainty, Tulsa, Oregon, UCF, most likely to get into the NCAA tournament in your mind. I mean, I, I can't say, I can't say Oregon just because, the you know the Pac-12 is going to be really tough sledding. Uh, I they're going to have to have some they're going to have to have some good good results. They would almost need an upset win over one of the big teams. I don't know. That's they have opportunities, but boy, that's a it's a tough way. And and when you go from really good to probably not getting a lot of help for the rest of the conference, you know it's kind of like the Big Ten: really good teams up top, really poor teams at the bottom. Not a lot of help if you don't pull off a good upset. Um, Tulsa, Tulsa was that, you know, they were that bubble team last year sitting right there, probably looking to be somewhere in that same, in that same boat. I, man, UCF ought to make it. I, I actually feel best about the, about UCF, especially with, you know, with, with what they have at the top. Now that's a team that's got to make the tournament. Well, this is one of those regions where the 3-4 constellation matchup is just as important as the 1-2 for NCAA purposes, where Tulsa, UCF, maybe Ohio State, you know, Oregon, whomever it is competing in that constellation match, you need a win just at this point of the season to start when, you know, it's never too early to start thinking about who's going to be ranked 44 come May 1st. All right, let's move on to our next region. Well, quickly, lock, who, I mean, you'd have Ohio State as a lock. Who do they play? Gosh, such a tough call. Um, a quick tough call, though. Uh, I'll go Tulsa. Wait, this is amazing. When you back up your head, this is a really stupid thing, but incentive to watch the YouTube feed. The loop on the college tennis ranks is exactly the same as your head. So back up, and it's a <laughs> silhouette, and your hat just goes perfectly into That's actually hilarious. When you like tilt a little bit, it's a, it's a funny silhouette of your head there. And I want you to know Chris did not plan that under any sort of fashion. All right. Let's move on to our next block. Michigan earns an impressive 4-1 four, uh, victory over Tennessee uh, to kick off their season. You look uh, for the Wolverines. Uh, they will host Northwestern, Arkansas, Cal Poly. That Northwestern-Arkansas match is fascinating, particularly after Northwestern beats NC State. Then 
I mean, we'll talk about Louisville when we get to them, but I noticed that Louisville result over Northwestern, how definitive it was. That was a testament to a Louisville team who we'll just have to talk about. Um, and I'm excited because that means Westoff's going to be watching a lot of college tennis this year. Um, but certainly you look for this Michigan team to the experience they bring back. Maloney, Styler, Fenty, Young, Bickerstaff, Nino, uh, Aaron Schneider, who we didn't see play Tennessee and I, I don't expect we'll see play this weekend either, but still so many experienced vets. We talked about Cooksey. Uh, obviously, they bring in a Bjorn Sf- Svensson as well, who had a fantastic summer on the pro circuit. What are you most fascinated about this Michigan team here on kickoff weekend? Yeah, I, I don't know that it, to your point, I don't know that it's going to be kickoff weekend because the, the thing that's got me most intrigued with with the Michigan team is what what's the real lineup, if you will, right? I mean, when we start getting into the the Big Ten matches against Ohio State and anybody else that, that may push them and then start getting towards the end of the season and NCAs, who's really playing then? I'll, I'm kind of with you. I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to see that this weekend. We probably don't see Aaron Schneider. We we may see some, some more cooks. I, I want to know what that's really going to look like towards the end. I just, it's, Again, it's hard for me to imagine a Michigan team that's not playing Aaron Schneider in singles, but they've they've got you know they've got seven or eight guys that can legitimately play. So ah, it, that it, it could be. Other than that, I mean, look, it's it's the same guys we saw last year. Short of yeah, Cooksey's going to get some time. I'd like to see some Bjorn Swenson. That's of the, when I get to watch. That's what that's what I would like to see. I want to see Swenson play and I want to see him. Look, we're talking about a guy that may not make the lineup that beat Adrian Boyton twice over the summer. Yeah. How how can that be? Right. I mean, but yeah. it is and it's legit. So so that's how good, the, how deep that team is. Cooksey was down to Diaz a set and six all, but he had found his footing in that second set, in my opinion, was the better player. Yeah, who plays six for Michigan? What do they do with their top three? Um, and then who's the three doubles? Because what we've seen so far is Young and Fenty, deservedly at one. Maloney and Styler. You feel really good about that team at two. Obviously, Nino's out right now. Him and Fenty have been a top 10 team. He'll factor into the doubles lineup in some fashion. But who's your three? That's what you're looking for. Do you split up that two? Do you keep rolling as is and you feel good where you're at? That's what you're looking for from a lineup perspective. And then... Last time we saw Michigan at the national indoor final site, they made the semifinals, but they haven't made it since. This will be a team that will be excited to have some matches on their home courts. That said, I mean, again, this Northwestern team is experienced. They bring back everyone. And when they beat NC State, it it was a surprise. It wasn't a shock. Like this team's top 25 good. They're going to have to earn it against Arkansas. New head coach, obviously, for the Razorbacks here this season. Cal Poly, also a part of this, uh, also part of this region. I ask you, as always, power rank Northwestern, Arkansas, Cal Poly, NCAA wise. How are you feeling? Northwestern's in. Okay. Uh, they, they've got to make it. A- after that, ooh, I mean, it's it's tricky. Arkansas, Arkansas is going. I mean, they're going to be one of those teams that's good. I mean. They're in that conversation uh, to start the year anyway of being one of those bo- bottom couple SEC teams that needs to find a way to move up. Look, there's not a there's not a 13 UTR on the roster. Um, it's it, it's it, it's not going to be easy sledding for them. So, but again, it doesn't take many wins. You you get three wins in the SEC and you've beaten three decent teams. That goes a long way in the point system. Uh, and Cal Poly clearly, I mean, it's it's all about conference for them. They're it's unlikely to happen on rank. They got to win the conference if they can win their conference, which is very possible. Uh, they're in Northwestern. To me, is the only team that's got. They've got to be a lock. Yeah, well, they're still figuring out their doubles certainly, but that's an experienced team. You bring over Yatsuka as well, who slides into that number two spot. He's played well. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting region. By the way, I was laughing as you were talking because you're not there yet. You'll get there. It's instinctual. We use world tennis number now here when covering college tennis. Come on, Chris. You'll get you'll get there. You'll get there. Um, you know, no disrespect to obviously uh that instinct because UTR is what it is. All right. I mean, again, who who gets through? Give me the pick. I think we've covered it. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, clearly Michigan gets through. I, I, they've got to play Northwestern. I mean, Northwestern absolutely. That's a that's a match they have to win uh, and and should win. They they play in the final, but it it ought to it that. That match ought to be a 4-0 Michigan match. There's right. there's not a lot of not a lot of of doubt in the in the outcome. You know, could they sneak a doubles point? Maybe I'll still take Michigan in a sweep. Northwestern frisky throughout the course of last year's Big Ten season. It's a lot of veterans back, so they'll know this Michigan team well. That will be a fun one. Let's move over to our next lock, and this is probably a surprise lock if you listen to our top 10 preseason shows as they were not an unequivocal top 10 team until they certainly became one. Let's move next to the USC Trojans, and obviously when you bring in a Kalamazoo champion as a January edition, as they did in Lerner Tien, who... He's still alive in Australia at the Junior Open, so I don't think we're going to see him here this weekend. I just that flight is a little tricky, even if it's still Australia to LA. But look, on paper, it's a very fun regional. USC playing Vanderbilt in match number one. The other match, Memphis taking on UCLA. It will be the Trojans' first of seventy-two unofficial matches against UCLA potentially this season. I mean, again, this Trojan team. We know just about all of the faces except Tien, Destanic, Mock, Merrick, uh, Ludwig, Fry, Colby. We know the group. How healthy are they? That's certainly the question. But you know, what do you expect to see? Is this why is this region a lock? When on paper, again, those are some some certainly testy names. Yeah, I mean, it, it's clearly okay. Look, they <clears throat> they've got to beat. They've got to beat Vanderbilt. There's no chance we see Lerner 10 this weekend. I mean, yeah. come on. The guy just won last yesterday in Australia uh, and it, it's already late. And uh, I'm not even sure. I think they're still alive in doubles. He and Cooper Williams, not positive, but yeah, he's in the quarters uh, of the uh, Australian open juniors. I certainly wouldn't be rushing home. And then even if you did, you're get you're jet lagged, et cetera. Like you said, yeah, maybe the best flight you could have just to LA, but no chance he's playing. They shouldn't need him. Yeah. It should be a UCLA uh, USC final. And yeah, there are, there are some names there that, that are interesting for, for UCLA. They've got some talent at the top, but just, just not as much. It's, you know, kind of like the argument you made earlier. They're, they're, they're a little, you know, they're a mini version that it's just a little bit better across the board for USC. So it would be really hard to imagine. Obviously that's why we play the match. It's not impossible but really hard to imagine that e- even if it's doubles, that they still find three more of those singles matches where, you know, they're just, they're going to be a dog at every position by a little bit. Uh, so it, it, that's going to be a tough ask. Yeah. I will say this also Clopper, Ross, Troost, Sissom. This Vanderbilt team was frisky all last year and they lost a couple of pieces, but a lot of them are back and I'm fascinated to see this is another one of those regions. The constellation will be interesting as well. Power rank them quickly. Memphis, UCLA, Vanderbilt, NCAA likelihood. Vanderbilt's a, it's tough. Vanderbilt's going to be in that, in that conversation of man, they, they're going to need some big wins out of our, uh, you know, like Arkansas did in the sec. To they get need there. a one in one weekend for sure. Uh, like they cannot lose both of these matches. Vanderbilt. Yeah. And it's, and that's, that's going to come up against Memphis. I mean, that, that's a, that's, you know, Memphis has got a lot of the pieces back that that they've had. So it's not, you know, Stevenson, Taylor cutting those guys have been there for, for quite a while. It's not going to be an easy match for them, but you're right. They need a one and one, uh, but, but for sure, UCLA, the, the, They've got to be in that. That's a team that's that's got to be a lock. They can't find a way to not make it, uh, you know, for anything to go wrong there. Um, I'm going to say uphill sledding for Vanderbilt. They're on the outside looking in Memphis probably right now is they're going to be that they're going to be the classic bubble team. Uh, I think they're sitting right there. I would say starting the year. Mm, maybe just out uh and and they're gonna ha- they're gonna have some they're gonna have a little uphill work to do as well the to, to your point assuming ucla makes the final it's a huge huge implication for the vandy memphis match somebody getting some points uh to help get them into the ncaa tournament well said and 
you know, again, we talk about the experience. USC, everyone on their roster this weekend will have played at least one dual match in their career. And, you know, again, they don't have Lerner this weekend, but we know what they're adding as well. US, how many points does USC drop this weekend as a lock? One. All right. One point is the prediction from Chris Halioris. Well, then let's move next to a region I know you will be attending in person. That, of course, is the University of Kentucky region. And why is Chris attending Kentucky? Not because he wants to do reporting on the ground for us here at Crack Rackets. No, it's because the dame who roots for the Liberty Flames has his flames in his home state. Kentucky hosting Liberty in match number one. Notre Dame, Washington also going to be on site here for this kickoff regional. This might actually be the lockiest of the locks we've talked about thus far. Like, I think Kentucky looks gets through pretty comfortably. What are you looking for most from the Wildcats, Chris? Yeah, there's, I, I mean, from a lock perspective, you're right. This is the the least amount of upset possibility of everybody we've talked about so far. I mean, it would be shocking, absolutely shocking if they managed to lose a match. I mean, it's going to be tough for them to lose a point this weekend, to be honest. Um, I think what I'm looking forward to seeing from Kentucky is a... Uh, you know, we, we know who the top four guys in that, in that lineup are. And then what Jaden weeks, the, the January, you know, signed from, from Canada, Cosnet, JJ Mercer, who who's playing again, to your point, if you're playing Cosnet this year as who's a freshman, you probably want to get him reps this weekend. JJ Mercer's been around, you know, what you're getting from JJ you probably want to see what you can get in your first, you know, I'll call it semi big competition. They should handle this weekend fairly easily, but unless if you're not super familiar with the Kentucky facility may not matter because they've only got four courts and the odds of six, even getting on and playing or getting on past five games in the first set, probably not real good uh, because between doubles and the first four singles matches, the match is likely already over. So I don't know that we'll see a lot of either of them. I guess, you know, so for for Kentucky, again, it'll be like the other schools. I'll want to see how they look in doubles and uh, and do they play a full roster up top or, or you know, or do some guys get some breaks? You, you, you can never be too careful. So I think you got to play your team. You got to play the lineup because you don't want to you can't afford to come out and not make indoors because you didn't play it. Uh, and I and I will look forward to what should be a Notre Dame Kentucky final and uh and looking and getting to see uh Sebastian Domenico for Notre Dame playing presumably Liam Draxel uh for for Kentucky it's always interesting you know, a lot of debate on is it Draxel Aini Aini Draxel but I think we see Draxel there uh that that'll be a real a really interesting match you know he's the Domenico's done really well for Notre Dame at the top and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing him play Draxel yeah, all right. So he takes Notre Dame over Washington. How many of these teams get to the NCAA tournament? Kentucky obviously won. How many of the other three? Uh, Liberty should, even if they don't get their on rank, they are the preseason favorites conference wise. So I'll say that they get they get there at a minimum just on the automatic bid for the conference. Uh, Washington, no. Ooh, Notre Dame. Gonna gonna need some upsets in in for them in the ACC. They are. I think they had a four three match against Ball State this weekend, or I forget who they played exactly. It was a tight one. Yeah, they they, they they're on the outside looking in for sure. I mean, oh. Domenico's a big upgrade for them up top, but they they're still not they're not deep enough right now. It's going to be tough. So I'd, I'd say you're only looking at two right now. ACC is tough. It's a deep conference. And certainly, you know, again, for this Kentucky team, who's going to be playing six? That's certainly a question. Um, what do the doubles teams look like? They still have some time to work that out. But Kentucky, another one of our six locks. Our final of this locks category. How about the defending national indoor champions, the TCU Horn Frogs? I can see the David Rodini parody account or the hat parody account already yelling at us on Twitter. Why haven't you talked about TCU yet? Well, we saved the best lock for last fake David Rodini TCU hat account. And, you know, again, they are the defending national indoor champions. A lot of the same faces we saw on last year's team. Jong, Famba, Fernley. 
Vives, Maxted, Jirasek. They're all back. Obviously, they bring in one of the top uh, juniors in the world in Sebastian Gorsny. Um Yeah, I, whether we see Jack Pennington or not, and as of right now, indications seem to be that we will not be seeing him. This TCU team is deep. They're talented. They've won this event before. Now, we haven't seen much of Fernley. Certainly, and it's been a very limited time here in January. I wonder if we see him this weekend from a lineup perspective. Who plays one? We thought it would be Famba once again. He was pretty darn good last season, but maybe they'll mix things up to start the year. Well, who's five? Who's six? That's always a question when you have this sort of depth. That said, TCU hosting Gonzaga, Utah, Texas Tech. This feels like another one of those lock of locks, Chris. Tell me what you look for for the Horned Frogs this weekend. Yeah, well, like you said, who's playing? I, I, so here's the real question. They, they they run, yeah, obviously, Pennington's not, he's not even eligible. He's not playing. Uh, the real question for you is, give me the money line on does Luke Swan catch a singles match? Wow. No, because there's only five indoor courts, and so they're not going to need yeah. it. For the same re- for the same reason I talked yeah. about Kentucky. Yeah, yeah, but, but to your point, I mean, he's going to be, you know, they're, they're going to run eight deep uh, on the roster. So he's going to be the, the eighth guy in there, but yeah, it's like every year with TCU, who's healthy. Do we, is, is everybody else ready to go? Are we going to see Fernley? Um, I think people are going to be surprised where they see Famba in the lineup if everybody is healthy. So, you know, I'll, I'll just leave it at that and let you tune in and find out, um, you know, spoiler alert, it's not at the top. Um, but but yeah, that that's that's going to be interesting just to see, kind of see the lineup decisions. Uh, I but again, I mean they're deep. You can they can pull. It doesn't matter. They can pull number one if they want. Whoever they've put in at number one, they can pull them and, and run, and and they're going to be just fine. Uh, we, it sh- we should, I say should we should see a lot. I mean I know for a lot of the fans, pre- Texas Tech probably a bigger name. Utah's a sneaky good team. Utah it will be will de- will definitely be. The, the light, you know, a, a favorite in that match, but it's really close. I mean, uh, but they've got a, they've got a top three that that's super, super solid, but you got Ollie Wallen who had a tremendous summer for Texas tech. I still think you have to take, uh, and with everything else going on at Texas tech, you got to take, uh, you got to take Utah to win that match, play TCU. Uh, but no, TCU shouldn't get, they should not get pushed. And uh, it's really just a matter. The biggest thing, like always with watching them, especially early in the season is who plays, who's healthy. Do they, is everybody ready to go? I'd be more excited about the team. Look, they're going to win. I I don't think there's any doubt about it. They're going to win. I will be more excited if the top six actually play and they play both days and and look healthy. That that's the big thing to me. No, well said. By the way, on that lineup note, we got a question from Will A. Are all protests finalized? They have been. We're not revealing the lineups here at Cracked Rackets till we get to Friday and we start our broadcast because that's the perks of being on the call now. You're trusted with information. You have to be trusted to it, folks. Again, we're going to have some fun stuff for you in the future. Um yeah, like oh, by the way, we got another question of who's the best team in the Big 10. For that, I will say Go listen to our preview podcast and you can hear the answer to that question. You're right. Utah was on the fringes of the top 30, top 25 at times last season. And I know Texas Tech, new coach, I believe it's Michael Brayler is the interim head coach right now. Uh, we'll see how they fare, who Utah gets through and then ultimately knocked out by TCU. Yep, that's that's what I'm going with. All right, I like it. Well, then, with that said, those are your locks. UVA, Ohio State, Michigan, USC, Kentucky, TCU. Chris, just to put some pressure on you, because I get to do this now since it's just the two of us, Jay and I were far quicker through our locks. He was far more concise than you were in his analysis. So, you know, get your – was there any reaction? Did we see Chris? Did he take a shot? I'm surprised he didn't go immediately to the whiskey. Is, all right, hang on. 
is that what the fans really want? No, I mean, that's not what they want. Exactly. Good answer. Uh, what they're disappointed in is there aren't more pokes at Gruskin. But we're, we're just – we haven't gotten to the non-locks yet. So Yeah, so no, the problem tuned. is I can't give my crazy takes and predictions. I'm almost uh, – what's the term? I'm muzzled. I'm muzzled because we're on the broadcast now. So I've, I've officially been – it took four years, Chris. You finally put a muzzle on me. Congratulations. Maybe when we get to Baylor, you can just be moozed. Yeah. <laughs> that's, hey. You're back. You're in prime <laughs> season four. Welcome back. I know. All right. Those are our locks. But again, if there are six locks, that means there are nine regions. We think some funny things, certainly some highly contested matches will unfold at. Let's move over to the popcorn regions next. Again, this is in no particular order, but let's start with the region that intrigues me most. It is in a particular order. We're going to North Carolina first, West off because the single best round number one match across the board on this ITA kickoff weekend, maybe men's or women's, is Harvard-Columbia in this UNC region. And Harvard has already knocked off NC State 4-3. Uh, UNC, a tough loss to South Carolina last weekend, but a tightly contested 4-3 match. Look, the fun part in this is I've mentioned Harvard. I've mentioned Columbia. I've mentioned North Carolina. Guess who North Carolina faces? Dustin Taylor and Oklahoma State in year two of DT's program. If you don't think Oklahoma is going to take another step forward here this season, you just don't know the track record of Dustin Taylor. Look, I mean, this region is exceptional, Chris. I'm just trying to think of how I can get you going. Um, in the in the best way. Fa- I mean, again, who is the team that intrigues you most in this region? Because I think you can make a case for all four. Yeah, well, uh, you absolutely can because we don't. I mean, look, North Carolina looked like they had you know top ten South Carolina dead to rights last weekend, and you know, and they did it without Zap too. And yeah, and m- managed to not pull it off, but you know, the margin to not pull it off is a fun the, way of framing it. Yeah, the the margins are so slim that it's a a point here or there or you know, per your tweets maybe a, a, a you know, a call here or there, but uh but yeah, it's it doesn't take a lot and that that could that could flip easily and and to your point, yeah, they didn't even have uh they didn't have everybody in the lineup. So it's to me, it is going to be very intriguing to see what they come out with. Uh, I, assuming we'll see, hopefully, Logan Zap. Yeah, the Harvard Columbia thing. Look, it was probably more. It was more geography based than anything. But look, when they got to draft Harvard pick Columbia pick, knowing they're playing Harvard in the first match, it's not like it's a surprise. They picked the match themselves. So, you know, Harvard's got to be going, look, they came right after us. I mean, they're they're coming after us. We're going to see them in conference. Uh, but, yeah, for those schools, it's all about, you know, we don't really want to travel all the way across the country, et cetera. And, yeah, let's get another another match against them. That's super intriguing. The Oklahoma State, I mean, look, obviously Dustin's building year. It's going to take a little time. He's building that program year after year. You you get a guy that like Isaac Bacroft, who's probably playing lower in the lineup now. You bring in a Chase Ferguson from USF. Uh, you know, it's it's very, very interesting team. It's it's one of those that we just haven't seen. We don't know what to make of them. I don't expect I it's still a little early, and they need a, another year of being able to bring recruits in and mature the team. Too early to think they're gonna pull something like that off, but very intriguing. Well, let me ask you this. I, I'm not asking, but what makes it interesting? Who's the best player in this region? Is it Cernock or Segerman? Who, by the way, you feel really good about that top two uh, going up against anyone. Their experience, their success. I mean, Henry von der Schulenberg, Harris Walker have had a ton of success over the past year. Michael Zhang, Zhang. Yeah. won the All-American Consolation and was a Junior Slam finalist at Wimbledon, right? He lost in the final, if memory serves me correct, or did he win it? I forget what it was. Um, but Michael Zhang, very, very good. And you've got Kotzen in this region as well. And then, by the way, Tyler Zink, who plays one for Oklahoma State, might have more pro success on his track record than any other guy in this region. In a year that feels open, because Ben is gone, because Sam is gone, Ben Shelton, Sam Rippus, August Holmgren, gone. Who Boy is Tom. the top guy? Boyton. <laughs> 
gone. Diallo, gone. <laughs> Who's the top guy? We don't know right now. Uh, you know, and it's it's kickoff weekend. We shouldn't know, but we definitely don't know. And yes, you know, Bosferetti, Quinn, although Quinn took some losses. Or yeah, was, a month ago, it was Quinn. Yeah, is it Corner <laughs> Chovink? Is it Spaziri? There are, you know, Kingsley. There are all Maloney. All these guys who are wanting to be in the conversation. A couple of guys on a couple of rosters as well. This is where we get to see it unfold. I think that's part of what makes this region fascinating as well. Yeah, like the Columbia lineup. We haven't seen, again, Columbia now actually has a year together as a group and their depth from like Westfall and, you know, uh, Kotzen, Ruger, Weingar, Horvat, all these guys they have options for. Harvard, same deal. North Carolina, same deal. Are we going to see Peter Murphy in the lineup with the new additions North Carolina has made? Maybe not. And Murphy was pretty solid to end last season. This region's extraordinarily deep. All of these teams are capable of men- making the NCAA tournament. So I can abandon that question and now just ask you straight up predictions. How are all four matches going to go, Chris? Wow. Th- this is one of the toughest regions to call. Clearly, I'm going to say I think North Carolina takes Oklahoma State on, on the first day. You say Harvard. clearly, but like, well, I, I just, agree. I mean, yeah, it's, but a home it's, gonna, match it's still going to be a close 4 1. Yeah. Yeah. It's a home match. And they're just so deep now that can this early in the season, that can be a good thing or a bad thing. They've got so many choices to to of who to play at the bo- where at the bottom of the lineup that you could easily this early in the season play the wrong guys, uh, you know, but but that there's more depth there than there is Oklahoma State. That's obviously in the in the early recruiting days. You can get some good solid up top. It takes a little longer to build that depth at the bottom. North Carolina should be able to outlast. But like you said, yeah, I know it's it could very easily be a super tight match. Uh, but I expect North Carolina to, to be able to pull that one off. The Harvard-Columbia match is, wow, just super intriguing. I think based on what I've seen, I just haven't seen enough Columbia yet. What I've seen from Harvard so far this year I really like, and I'm going to have to go with the Crimson in that match, just just based on what I've seen. So now we come down to a North Carolina Harvard. And I can't believe, I, I honestly can't believe I'm going to say this because I really want to take Harvard and it should be an upset region. I'm going to say the heels come out of, on top at home. Wow. All right. I like it. So again, Chris Hallioris, that might be a little Will Blumberg home cooking pick. He doesn't want to have to face him on the broadcast, having picked against the heels. But look, Harvard, a 4 3 win over NC State. Columbia's got a ton, you know, top 10 recruiting class after top 10 recruiting class. It's going to be a battle. That is certainly a popcorn region here on ITA kickoff weekend. All right, from the rest of the way, I promise out of order, but I think that's your unequivocal number one region. Let's move next to Wake Forest, another popcorn region. Wake Forest, we saw their lineup in action. We had no idea what it was going to look like, who was going to be back on the roster. We actually are seeing Tachi play matches, which after two years of unknown, Tachi, he's back. He's playing. He's having success. This Wake Forest team beat Tennessee 4-3 at home after dropping the doubles point. And look, Maroney, Estafalu, Karamov, there's talent on this roster. There's a lot of names on this roster we don't know about, but Tony Bresky will find them in all corners of the globe and manage to find a way to put four points on the board. They're at home as well. Always a thing you like. And yet this region, Chris, Middle Tennessee, who, of course, was a top 16 team throughout the course of last season, a Duke team where it feels like this is a year where if Duke is ever going to get to host an NCAA region and get themselves back where they should be, Ramsey Smith has the team this year. John, Zhang, the Krugs, and you know some of the options they have elsewhere down the lineup. And then I haven't even mentioned Auburn, who was maybe the surprise team of last year. Just a really good core group, and a lot of that core is back. Merget, Nolan, Stice, Galka, you know, all the guys that – were top 25 for the majority of last season. Yes, they lost one of their big weapons, but yes, they are all pretty much back. Again, all four of these teams, NCAA tournament teams. So I ask you, Chris, pick one. Who intrigues you the most and why? 
I think it's probably actually Duke. Ooh, I like that pick. Yeah, because for the for the reasons you mentioned, this is the year. I mean, I they've got the pieces now. Can they actually do something with them? Uh, and this and this is an outstanding region. I mean, it's not. There's no easy match for anybody here. All all four matches in this region are going to be competitive matches both the you know both the first day and the championship of consolation both all going to be good matches i want to see so what to that point quickly not to cut you off but the unc region you had four top 40 teams because oklahoma state's not top 20 not quite top 25 yet here at you UN, uh, at wake you might not have a top 12 team the way you do at that unc region in unc harvard and columbia but between wake middle tennessee Duke and uh, Auburn here, you have four top 25 teams. Yeah, that's right. You're going to, I mean, whoever's at the bottom is. is Hardest fought 0-2 in kickoff weekend history. Yeah, is going to be a right a bubble right on the border of a top 25 team. And that's your worst team in the region. That's what's going to make these matches super competitive. So, yeah, I really want to see, you know, what the, what the, I mean, there's no surprise with Garrett Johns. We know what Johns can do. And we even know what Zang can do. But I want to see Redanius, what, what's Redanius got. Are are you know is Connor Cruz playing? Is Jake Krug playing, or, or are we seeing some other guys in there? What what's that bottom half of the Duke lineup look like? Because that to me will tell me how competitive they are. We know the top's good. Four, five, and six. Are they going to be super super competitive with the top ACC teams or not? And that's going to be the difference maker. Let me uh, or pose this to you. Of these four teams, is it fair to say that we know the least about Wake Forest? Because I know Wake Forest beat Tennessee 4-3 because, of course, they did. You just knew that was going to happen. Like, Tony Bresky was going to win that match because that's just like, now all of us here have to be like, wait, who's on Wake Forest's roster? Like, tell me a little bit more about the Baroon kid. Like, wait, so Tachi isn't just a figment of my imagination. Again, it turns out he's real. Like, I feel like we know less about them than any of the other three teams. Yeah, I mean, Tachi is actually not Tim Siebert's brother. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Cousins, cousins. Yeah, yeah. Cause, uh, no, you're right, because look, we saw in the Tennessee match, they, they played Tom... Thompson and and uh, and Lopez at five and six guys. We've never. I mean, they, they've both been there. We've not seen them play, um, and they're good. It's like, I, yeah, they're fine. I, yeah, it's it's it, yeah, it is tough. It's tough to see. Yeah, it's just it, it's not. Uh, they've had a roster full of eighteen guys for the last several years, and now some of these guys that were down there, like Thompson. Uh, and, and like Lopez are actually getting to play matches and, and they're, and they've, you know, obviously spent some time in the system and, and gotten good, but no, I think you're right. We know, we know all the guys on the Auburn team. We know, you know, most of the guys on the middle Tennessee team who, by the way, we haven't mentioned, but slump is back. Roca is back. Polson is back. Like a lot of the core is back. Yeah, Pavel Modal's back. Yeah, and, Modal's and then back. A couple, a couple new guys in there. But yeah, we we know a lot of that. Uh, you know, I want to see some of the bottom, but even some of those guys from Duke are back. Yeah, like you said, we we've, we've not we know we know Maroney. Although you know Maroney was looked really really good and then got hurt and disappeared, uh, and we didn't get to see of him. Karamov was kind of like, wow, all these expectations, and we didn't get what we wanted to see from him. Tachi never ever played, so even the guys that you know theoretically in the top of the lineup, we don't have a lot of confidence in what we know about them. Well, people know, again, on this show, it's been a long running joke dating back to when they both arrived that it's Mission Impossible style. Tachi takes off his face mask, Ethan Hawk style, and it's just Maroney under it. And he's like, yeah, that's why only one of us can play at any time, because we are actually the same person. Um, no, it's great to see again who this Wake Forest team will be. Again, it's Wake Forest versus Auburn. Ooh. That's a tough first match. I mean, Middle and Tennessee versus Auburn, Duke. Auburn picks that location after NCAA. And they had the like a, they had one of the first 10 picks. And yeah. like they were like, nope, we're going to Wake. Which, by the way, back. you can understand because we don't know anything about this Wake roster. And then they just go and beat Tennessee because, of course, they do. Prediction. Give it to me, Chris. I mean, after what we saw Wake Forest do, even though I'm the SEC guy, I've got to say 
I've got to take them to win their first match over Auburn. Uh, I mean, I love the Auburn guys. That's a, We've talked about it before. That's a team before a bunch of individuals. They play as a team. They're all in it as a team. It's not going to be an easy out at home, indoors. I'll take Wake. Middle Tennessee, Duke. Uh, I mean, look, if if this is the year for Duke and 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 it has to be, it's a match they've got to win. Middle Tennessee is not going to be an easy out. They they lost at Mississippi State last weekend indoors. Duke ought to be able to do the same thing. We should be looking at a Wake Duke final. Wow. Previews of who's in the battle behind UVA in the ACC. Great preview for that. Oh, I'm I'm doing it. I'm going Blue Devils. Wow. All right. We asked Chris to be bold. He brings a first bold take to this podcast. His first upset coming at the Wake Forest region. He'll take Duke over the Demon Deacons. Let's move next to a team that might be surprising to have in this region, but it says less about them and more about the opponents that they face. Let's move to Texas next, a program we typically see at the final 16, a team that beats Florida. In the round of 16 last year at the National Indoors, just a quick message that, hey, our core, what we did in 2021 was real. Of course, they bring all of that core back here this season. The question is, of course, how healthy is this Texas team at any point of the year, let alone here in the month of January? And the look again, Texas is the favorites, but listen to this region. It's not necessarily, you know, again, well, just across the board, Texas plays Cal. First match of the year. Cal already beat Stanford throughout the course of this season. Cal has guys like Kikuchi, like Jackson, like options we'll get into in a second that can make life uncomfortable for the Longhorns. Of course, looming on the other side of the region is an Arizona team just littered with so many different veterans. Of course, whether it's Zeverts, whether it's Gustav Strom, we've now seen a year of Colton Smith, one of the better freshmen we saw in the country, Double H, Lagayev. It's a battle-tested team, a team that's made an NCAA Sweet 16, a team that will not be intimidated by the stage of facing Texas as they've seen them before. I will defer to you on Florida Atlantic, who I need to know more about, and I'm ashamed that I don't. But again, you look at this team, Chris, Texas, Arizona, Cal, three legitimate top 25, if not better, squads here this year. Talk to me about this region, what fascinates you most. Yeah, this this is a tough region, and FAU's in a tough spot. Look, FAU's built; they've done some good building. Like when you're in that mid-major spot, like they are, you look to the portal, you look to grab guys. They've brought in uh, they brought in a couple years ago Kevin Humpner from Kentucky. This year, they've got uh, one of my guys, Al, you know, Albi Alberto Colas Sanchez from Mississippi State last year. Uh, he's now at FAU. They've got a core there of good players. But wow, the other three teams in this region are just, you know, we're talking power five, good power five schools, and then FAU having to battle them. It's going to be a tough weekend for FAU. Uh, I mean, the Cal team, like you said, none of us saw even a boss of a ready list Stanford team. We did not see losing to Cal like that. And and for Cal, you mentioned it. Yeah, you've got Kikuchi. You've got Ryder Jackson. You've got Sid the Man. Is that what we're calling him now? Sid the Man. Fifth year <laughs> Sid the Kid Banthia. Now the man. And Overbeck as well. And, like that's and, and a veteran. Overbeck. Yeah, I mean, it's a it, it's a deep. And I think they won at five today. and six against Stanford, which like, again, Stanford's depth to their weakest spot, but that's where Cal got them. Yeah. I, and so, yeah, if you don't come prepared, it's, but, you know, even that, so you, you'd say FA is probably the weakest, then probably Cal after that. And then you get into, wow, Arizona. I mean, look, they've, they, they've got, I think, maybe one new name in there that might that might play. But everybody else, it's the same guys that we all know that you that you ran through. Right. And and the Texas team is all of the same guys as well. That's just brutal. Like you said, it's not about the, they're not in the, not, they're not in the lock region, not because of them, but because of these other teams. And because of the fact that Cal had that huge, you get an upset win over Stanford, all of a sudden, you know, 
it's probably good for Texas that that happened because they're not going to overlook them now. Everybody on that team knows, look, these guys just beat Stanford. Do not take them lightly. And then if you win, you're going to end up in all likelihood and should play Arizona. They've played Arizona multiple times over the past couple of years. Two uh, cores that know each other very yeah, well. They, they know each other well. That'll be an absolute war. Yeah, no, they'll get after it. That'll be a loud match, very loud match. And look, I mean, again, for this Texas team who hasn't had Braswell, as Will A points out, or excuse me, who Scotty B points out in the comment section, and they haven't had him, but Spaziri beat, gets a win over Quinn. He has looked exceptional. And, you know, again, they haven't had Braswell, but you still have P.Y., Pierre Bailey seems healthy. Waldeeb, the the Waldeeb we see in the fall seems to have transitioned to this January with that same momentum. Harper's a baller. Chi Chi's a baller. McDonald's gotten so many matches over the year in a pinch that you don't feel terrible about him either. It's going to be a really, really good region. Because, again, you have three teams. And why this region's popcorn is not to disrespect Texas. It's out of – and they may take this as disrespectful that they're not a lock. Because even without Braswell, they're still a team. I mean, look at what they did at the National Indoors last year, despite not being healthy. Um, but Cal beating Stanford, you have to take them as a top 25 team now. We knew what Arizona is, a team that expects to host the first two rounds of the NCAA tournament, if not better, here this season. With that in mind, Chris. And by the way, last thing. Kikuchi, sneaky, dark horse pick. He'd be like the 50-1 to underdog to finish the college tennis season ranked number one in the country because he had some really good pro circuit results over the course of the past six months. Give me your picks. Who wins what? Who goes where? Yeah, I mean... I. As much as I like the the possibilities of that Texas Cal match, I've got to take Texas in the first match. Arizona clearly a heavy favorite over FAU, so we get a Texas Arizona match that we've seen multiple times uh, over the past couple of years. At home for Texas, I can't get away. I, that's a match where I think if there's no Braswell, that could be dangerous. They, you know. I mean, obviously it could be dangerous no matter what, but they they may really need him there. I do like what we've seen out of Waldeeb in a continuation from the fall. M- makes me feel, you know, that that right there makes me feel better about Texas's odds. I didn't feel great about what I saw, for example, in the Florida match out of the top half of the lineup. Didn't give me great feelings. But the where I have the most doubts being the bottom, I actually feel okay about. I like Texas. I'll take the Longhorns at home. Yeah, I mean, again, you look for this Texas team coming into the weekend 3-0 and overall, but they have played Florida, who they beat 5-2. They have played Georgia, who they beat 4-3. They have been battle-tested. And yeah, like again, they'll be ready for this match. This is a very experienced core that is ready to do some big things because we've called Texas a team that's a year away for a, two years now, and now it's their year, and you feel like this is their time. But again, they are certainly going to be tested. Well, you know, again, we talked about all of Cal's success, and we mentioned that match against Stanford. Let's go to Stanford next because that's another region we have in our popcorn section. And, you know, Chris, Some scholars have argued I have one of the better memories of my generation. They've often been upset that I decided to apply to college tennis and not something perhaps more productive to societal value. Uh, But my memory has me remembering. Shout out to my lack of command of English. Memory doesn't help with that. But I love this Texas A&M team to end last season. I said this A&M team had moved into the year away category. And... Look, when you look at the Stanford region, Stanford, obviously the hosts, and we have yet to see Nishesh Basavaretti play throughout the course of this January, as we know he's dealing with some injuries. But look, you've got A&M in this section. You've got a Pepperdine team that's really deep, really talented, extraordinarily battle tested, and maybe in Daniel DeJong have arguably the best player in the region. Now, look, Arthur Ferry would like to have a cup of coffee in that conversation but Ferry took a tough loss to Kikuchi and we know Jong's capable of that tennis Schachter just beat Dostanik he's capable of that tennis Martin over at Georgia Tech was one of the 20 best players in the country last season we know what he's capable of and by the way 
your first round matchups, Stanford versus Georgia Tech team that brings back Martin and McDaniel at the top of their lineup, a, you know, Pepperdine A&M battle, two teams that are very similar in that you maybe don't have an unequivocal blue chip number one guy, no disrespect to DeJong or Schachter, but you have really good tennis players in every position on your roster. This Pepperdine A&M battle, the epitomization of the depth we see in college tennis this year. So with that preface, I ask you, Chris, what intrigues you most about this region? I mean, that the all four teams are good. I'm really interested to see the Pepperdine A&M match. I mean, it's going to be if Columbia Harvard's number one, that's two. A and M's an enigma to me right now because they went through that you know the hidden duels and and invites if you will section looking so good play you know all the guys shacked are you know going undefeated in one of those weekends against really quality opponents uh, get the whole team picking up a bunch of wins and you're thinking wow man this you know these guys the, things are looking great and then they go and drop a four three loss to San Diego. A team, no disrespect to San Diego, but a team that they should not have been taking a 4-3 loss against. Well, it's not even that they lost 4-3 to San Diego. It's that they lost 4-3 and they lost the 3 through 6 singles position. Yeah, they lose 3-4-5-6. Now, now, granted, no Perego. So I'm in, I'm also interested to see is, you know, is that because Perego's, you know, got something going on? Is he injured and, and he's not playing this weekend or is he in? But regardless, I mean... Luke Casper should be a, a lock at six. I mean, uh, the fact that you play him at six and, and then he and then he goes and loses. And and I mean, it's, yeah, that that was an, an inexplicable loss for me. So I, I don't know what to make of those guys yet. And and it's not like any of them are young guys. They're all veterans. You know, that match sent you Schachter, Perot, Rollins, Hildebrand, Roddick, Casper. Every one of them has been around. I mean, it's, it, it's you're not playing freshmen. So. So I don't know. That's interesting. But again, like you said, I don't think Stanford's in danger of necessarily losing the mat, losing a match to Georgia Tech. But Andres Martin can beat anybody. <laughs> so so a Martin Ferry match, that's going to be that 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 is a popcorn match unto itself. I don't know the top three, Marcus McDaniel, a former guy that was right up there. And then Chopra, you know, for for Georgia Tech as well. It gets a a little bit slimmer after that. The the depth on Stanford, even without Basavaretti, yes, it's the Stanford weakness. It should still be good enough to get them through that match. Ah, but so I'll take I'll take Stanford in the first one. Wow, Pepperdine A and M. I just don't I don't know what there's a there's a lot of experience, like you said there. Man. I, I don't even know. I feel like you now, I don't want to pick because I really, really, really like both coaching yeah. staffs who I talk to a lot. I like <laughs> all I, four coaching staffs. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I can't, uh, in particular, even assistant coach Kevin O'Shea at A&M and, and coach Shackerly. Boy, I don't want to, I don't want the calls after this when I pick against one of them. Plus Chris, I'll never forget 2018 to hear Bill Kallenberg rave about Kenny Thorne. I legitimately thought he was the second coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, man, I, uh, you're going to make me do it. I, I mean, I got to take A&M. They, I don't know what happened. I'm just going to write that San Diego match off. Like, I, I don't know what happened, but the way they looked prior to that, boy, they looked tremendous. Uh, so I'll, I'll take, I'll take A&M in that match. They'll play Stanford. And boy, that's a dangerous match because A&M has the depth that could expose the bottom of the Stanford lineup, just like it was exposed against Cal. Um, and you know, and 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 Noah Schachter can beat anybody if you know that that's a must win for Stanford up top with what they're with what they've got. If there's no boss of already, and I don't know if he's ready to go yet. Was that pun intentional? I uh, know, but I'm. Oh, do I want to? Man, do it. Just because Coach O'Shea owes me a bottle of Blantons. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take the, a, I'm going to take the Aggies and say that they go in and pull the upset on the premise that I, we haven't seen boss of already yet. I don't think he plays. I think A&M exposes the bottom of the lineup again, and they pull the upset off.
even though they lost three through six against San Diego. What a massive win I, for San I Diego know. team. That, I don't know Holmgren how that. Holmgren yeah. and Davies are now gone. Yo, know, I mean, again, there's your upset. You're taking A and M. Again, don't sleep on a Pepperdine team. DeJong is back. You know, Z yeah, is back. Yeah, I like Bassa I like an upset. Hadigian fell in at like you know. Again, they've got a team. Yeah, yeah, even yeah, Pietro Felon, the guy he looked incredible at two early in the year last no, year. No, it's crazy. Again, it's probably going to be in the bottom of the lineup. Yeah, I even if if Pepperdine wins that, I still like the prospects of an upset uh, right. if there's no boss already in the lineup. All right. I like it. Well, then with that said, let's move to our final popcorn region. It's the Baylor Bears, and you look for this Baylor team. Yes, it was a tough loss for them to Virginia last weekend, but I do think. There were encouraging signs for a Baylor team that is working in so many new pieces and with the pieces they do have returning, just about all of them, taking a big step up in the lineup. You look for this Baylor Bear team. Look, they're going to get tested right away. Arizona State, round number one. I talked about who might be the best player in college tennis. A lot of people would put Murphy Cassone right at, if not very much at, the top of their list. You have a San Diego team that just beat Texas A&M three through six positions. Obviously they have to be taken seriously. And then you have a new top 10 team in Florida state with arguably the best player in the country and our Antoine Cornut Chauvink, a team that beat Georgia already this season, a team that's got some really good depth as well. Chris, what intrigues you most about this region? Yeah. I mean, outside, uh, outside of getting to see, you know, see Murphy, who I think you're right is probably, you know, he's a top five college player. Um, the issue, the, the issue there is, I don't know that we get to see him play, you know, that, that great a match, if you will, the, the strength of the Baylor team is going to be more depth than it is the top of the lineup. Murphy's going to be a clear favorite there. And then if we get what we expect to see, which is a Baylor Florida state final, we get a San Diego match for, for Murphy, where he's going to be a monstrous favorite in, in that match. So I don't know that we really get to see a big test for him. I think it's all it's you know probably inevitable we're getting a Florida State Baylor final. That's you know that's the match we want to see. That's the intriguing match. Florida State's you know the big win over Georgia already. Don't underestimate Baylor coming off you know what appeared on paper like a trouncing at, at Virginia. Right, that is you know it's not going to be. This will not be a lopsided match. Uh, boy, up and down the lineup, I'm interested to see what, what these teams do. Just what, you know, what the lineups are. There's no doubt we got we have to see ACC at one for Florida State. Uh, we're in all likelihood going to see what Baylor's been playing, which is Finn Bass at one. I'm more interested to see what Florida State does with the rest of the lineup. You know, are they leaving LP up at the top because he played one for them last year? Honestly, you know, performance hasn't deserved it this year. Who's Baylor playing in, in terms of the, the the bottom of that lineup? We've seen we've seen Musa play. We've you know we've seen obviously you know Finn Bass and and Miladinovic and, and Mizuchi and, and Teddy Paralek. Uh, I think we know who's in the lineup for them, maybe. But you know, Zambor is you know one of the freshmen that is actually eligible and playing. It's going to be an interesting lineup, an interesting decision. I think that's a very intriguing match. Boy, at Baylor. Man. Look, that that, that, that final match is going to get, it's going to be a late match on the final day. They're an outdoor site. It's going to be cold. The match is probably going indoors. It gets loud in there. Big home court advantage. Is it enough to say? I I do think we're going to have to say that it's going to be an upset for Baylor to win. Uh, obviously, it's a very winnable match. Florida State, with what they've done and the way they've come out, has to be the favorite. I mean, I I can't get away from it. I, I I'm getting a call from one side or the other. Either way. Just crucify me if you want to, Coach Woodson. I'm taking the Knolls. 
All right. He's taken Florida State. And by the way, that's an Arizona State-San Diego battle that matters quite a bit. You know, Baylor, Florida State's for top 16. If Arizona State wants to get to the NCAA tournament, they have to beat a San Diego team that, again, just beat a and And, you know, if they walk out of this kickoff weekend one and one with some of the things they're still trying to work through from a lineup perspective, you're feeling pretty good if you're Coach Cackley heading into the remainder of this season. But all right. Those are the popcorn regions. And again, I'm excited to see that. I love that you framed it as it's a Baylor upset if they beat Florida State at home. He's in prime form, folks. Chris Alioris is ready for this 2023 season. I'm, I'm doing my best just to give Coach Woodson billboard material for the team. You know? Yeah, by the way, Woodson, not the only one who will crucify you. Scotty B saying he'll get you as well. <laughs> All of those popcorn regions popcorn because they provide upsets but we have some more formal upset alerts as well let's move to georgia next who's obviously had themselves a tough start to the season albeit they have played one of if not the toughest schedule we've seen thus far uh in all of college tennis you look uh for this georgia team they drop a match to florida state they obviously uh drop another match to texas as well but two top 10 teams right now in the ITA rankings. You know, you look for Georgia on paper, LSU, Miami, a Louisville team that just played Northwestern extraordinarily well, Chris, and I'm ready for you to tell me why we should or shouldn't be excited about them. Look, Ethan Quinn, who is unbelievable throughout the course of the fall, he's played Arguably, the two other best players in college tennis, Spazieri and Cornet Chauvin. Welcome to college tennis, my friend. Talk about a rough introduction. But look, Mar- Martin, Holman, Rodriguez, all guys with experience for Louisville, Miami, LSU, respectively. This Louisville team's really deep. This Miami team's pretty experienced. Obviously, LSU bringing in a new coaching staff. We'll see what Danny Bryan's got in store for us. Why are the Bulldogs on upset alert? Talk to me about this region, Chris. Yeah, I mean, multiple reasons. One, yeah, certainly, yeah, a lot of good things already that we've seen out of Georgia, Louisville, Miami. We don't know what Coach Bryan's got back, you know, in his first year back at at LSU. Obviously, he returns Ronnie Holman. He brings Latinovich over from from Wichita State with them. Uh, Brings in Chen Dong from Georgia Tech. Welsh Hotard from Oklahoma. A lot of, you know as you would expect when you don't get to start your own recruiting class, you you go and you get a lot of transfers and he's got a lot of talent on the roster. It shouldn't be enough to beat Georgia that, you know, might be in, there might be some intriguing matches there, but look, Georgia has gotten off to, as you pointed out, a very rough start to the, to this spring season. So anything could happen. They should get through that match. The intriguing part to me is look, Louisville had the great win over Northwestern. They should, you know, they should be able to beat Miami. But look, Miami had that hidden duel that had Georgia and other schools there. Miami took the top four spots off of Georgia. Not just one of the matches, not two, all four. They swept them in the top four in that hidden duel, which is... I still, I, again, it's just a head scratcher like AM to me, you know, losing their match. I, I don't know how that happened. Louisville, top of that lineup, really good. So Fabian Sala back for, you know, was at Louisville, went to Arizona State, now back at Louisville. Donette, the Oklahoma State transfer, been there a couple of years. Rodriguez, you know, Hernandez, Fung, Mizrahi, has been there forever. It seems like, play, you know, playing at, at the bottom of the lineup for them. Very, very solid veteran team, good a good indoor team, Miami, meh, not so much the 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 indoor team. I like Louisville in that match. I I think you know obviously they're playing. Did you well. hear that West off? Yeah, I don't want to get West off too excited, and you know I I don't want to get Rodrigo too excited that I'm going to be coming down to the to the center to watch any matches anytime soon. But but yeah, no, I do. I like. I will be down there, and I do. I like. I like the Louisville team. It, this could be a good year for them to, you know, to make a little bit of noise in the ACC. They, you know, they're always kind of right. They're knocking, not quite good enough. They've got the same core back, good team. Let's, let's see if they can do it. Miami, oh, they're, they're not looking bad after what they did in, in that, that hidden duel where they had a bunch of good teams there. So that could go either way. I'll take Louisville. I'll take Georgia. Wow. 
Does Georgia continue the slide? Well, the question is, who's at six? Who's the doubles team? Because we know Quinn, Kreuter, uh, Henning, Yuska, Bride. We know what they're capable of. How well will they play? Who plays six? What is the doubles? Yeah, give me the pick, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to... I haven't seen a lot this year. I'll just go back to even watching. I remember, you know, watching the match. I think it was at, it was either at NC state or at wake forest. I don't remember last year that the match where I, it was the same kind of questions and it was paying at six. He didn't win the match, but he looked, I, I thought he looked great indoors. I'll take a, I, I like paying at six. I say Georgia, you know, Quinn cannot continue to be, I don't, you know, gotten in some sort of funk that, that slide's not going to continue. Bride actually, that was what I'm encouraged with is Bride was one of my bigger questions. I don't think he's looked bad. Um, I I I think he's shown a, a, you know some form. It's not great, but he's so, shown some form for them. Uh everybody else I think is fine. Yeah. Henning, Kreuter, Huska, the those are all they're they're in great spots. It's what do they get out of six? They should be able to beat Louisville. With or without that, and regard, and whoever's playing at six should still win that match at six. Doubles, they they're they're fine. They could be closer than we think, but I'll go four two Georgia over Louisville. All right, I like it. Then let's move to our next seat on upset alert. And very much this is a byproduct of what we saw at the opening weekend because on paper, Mitsui Monday, Hud, Bicknell, Diaz, Harper, Prada, Kozlov. The University of Tennessee has a lot of options on their roster, even if they are without uh, their, even if they're without Luca Brancatelli or RJ Hunter, as they thought they might be to start this season. But look, after a four-one loss to Michigan, where they had the wrong doubles teams, they were flat from start to finish. That edge that has defined this Tennessee team just, and it 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 was tough because Michigan was on them from the start, but. I didn't see that edge in their match against Michigan. I watched intently, and I liked the doubles adjustments they made. I really like splitting up Mitsui and Harper, putting one of them with Monday, the other with either HUD or Bicknell to work with those weapons. I love that adjustment. Now they're still looking for a five and six you know, combination right now, still trying to figure out who goes where in this singles lineup. And look, again, why are they on upset alert? They're still the favorite. They're the defending national indoor finalists. This is a really good team that's been really good indoors for the better part of three consecutive, four consecutive early years now. But look, at all due respect to Louisiana, who they play round one. All due respect to Charlotte, who I think is solid. This weekend's about finding out how good Oklahoma is. And this is an Oklahoma team that has a bunch of pieces. Whether you look at this Oklahoma team, Alex Martinez, we know. Jordan Hassan, we know. Nathan Hahn, we know. The addition of Sifo Satando Mansi, the All-American from the University of Illinois, that is a fascinating addition to this roster. They've got the sort of pieces that would make any team uncomfortable. How do the struggles from last weekend translate over to this weekend for Tennessee, who, for what it's worth now, at least get to play on home soil? I think we agree it's going to be Oklahoma, Tennessee, Chris. So your thoughts on those two teams? Give me a pick. Yeah, absolutely. It has to be those two, which is why this is, uh, you know, it's not popcorn, but it's definitely still an upset alert. Yeah, there's just something that's been going, you know, something is not right so far in the season with Tennessee and maybe home cooking, you know, men's all wounds. It's Uh, also not right because let's be clear, their standard these last years have been competing for national indoor or outdoor championships. And the team we saw last weekend will not be doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And and look, we've seen Prada in doubles. Haven't seen Prada in singles. Is that, you know, I don't know. Is he just getting beat out? And if that's the case, I'm actually worried. Or is he, you know, healthy enough to play doubles, but he's not in good enough spot really to be able to play, you know, singles yet? Because I think for them, you know, especially now with no Kent Hunter, they they need what Prada can do for them in the lineup. You know it, it, the the guys the guys they had playing uh, in Kozlov and Diaz against Thompson and and Lopez for Wake Forest should it, that should have been two and zero oh, we're out 
and it wasn't. And that's worrisome to me. And and that's where I say, man, if that's what we're going to get, we've got to have a healthy product, at least pushing them uh, out there. I do think I will a- say, though, Kozlov played really well against Bickerstaff. If that's the Kozlov they're getting this season, he will. And Diaz played fine, too. Like, again, Bicknell took two losses. Like, how about uh, yeah, that I mean, for a shock? I, yeah. It, look, it hasn't been a great... It hasn't been a great last, what you know, four months, six months, eight months, whatever you want to go. At, you know, sit, you know, j- just the the ITF circuit in general for Bicknell. I, you know, I don't know how you how you live up to an undefeated season uh, and winning a national championship with you know with Florida to going into having to sit a year and now you play a bunch of tournaments. I mean, there, you can't you can't get any better than not losing. Uh, but but it hasn't been great, and then he's led so into the college season this year. That's not great. Look, he's already yeah, like you said, hell, he lost a couple matches over the weekend. Much less the fact that he didn't lose any for an entire year the last time he was at Florida. So he yeah, he's struggling from that perspective a little. I do think getting back home will be a big deal for them. But you mentioned it the the names we uh, Martinez Hassan. They've looked great for for Oklahoma. Do they have the rest of the pieces? Look, Cephas Monsi, we knew what he was at Illinois. That should be tremendous for them. Him versus Bicknell at four, if that happens, is hilarious. <laughs> like, how is that a four singles match? Yeah, uh, yeah. I who knows? I. Yeah, I. I don't know. I. It's just. It's a lot of talent on that roster. And I want to, you know, the problem is I want to say that I don't know if it's deep enough, but with what we've seen in the five, six Rome for Tennessee so far, it's not deep enough either, but Tennessee's back home. Look, they, they may not have looked great. They may not have looked like a team, but still was not a complete blowout against Michigan. They had some tight. Yes. They, you know, they lost the score didn't look good, but there were some tight matches going that were, you know, left on court. It was a 4-3 match with Wake Forest. It's not like they got, you know, totally annihilated. They come home. They play at home. They're going to find a way to win. I'll take the Vols 4-2 over Oklahoma. All right. There's your pick from Chris Hallior. It's not an upset, despite the Vols being certainly on upset alert. Well, then let's move on to our other two regions are final to the best of the rest as we have labeled them south carolina big 4-3 win over north carolina they bring back a lot of familiar faces right samuel and uh lambling and everyone just about everyone in that roster we have seen once or twice uh around the block they're going to take on penn penn now coached by rich bonifiglio shout out to rich first head coaching job won't be his last um that's a fun first round match that said I think we know it'll probably be a VCU, very frisky team. We expect to see them in the NCAA tournament, but I think all of us are expecting NC State, South Carolina, NC State, two tough losses, Northwestern, Harvard to start their season. Boy, would they like to write the ship here in Columbia at that new indoor facility. Chris, your thoughts on this region? Just give me your take. Give me your pick. Yeah, clearly South Carolina is going to be favored over Penn, uh, NC State going to be favored over VCU. But yeah, it as you said, a frisky VCU team. Uh, you know, I don't think NC State will have a terrible time getting through there, but uh, that that could be an upset alert. Man, that's a tough match to call. To your point, I was I honestly was hopeful that we'd see Daniel Rodriguez back for South Carolina this year. He was undecided for the longest time. We haven't seen him, which I assume means he's not coming back. Sure. Uh, yeah. Tom's, you know, you, you obviously you talked about Samuel Lambling. We still got Connor Thompson, Thompson got Story, Beasley, the whole yeah. crew. The, the guy that I know, I know had a really good fall and Josh coach Goffey was high on last year. But but knew he needed another year was Casey Hool. Uh, he looks really good. It is indoors. It's not the NC State indoors. I think this is one of those matches that if you told me we were playing indoors at NC State, I would take NC State. 
but we're playing indoors at Columbia. They're different courts, not the same surface, a different environment. I NC State's not been, you know, not been bad, not been great. Uh, obviously, because of the losses, I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take South Carolina at home. I think this is a four three match. It's good that NC State's been calloused up. By the way, VCU, the hottest thing since sliced bread, the Bertamon brothers who made that NCAA semifinal run, they're back for the Commodores this season. Yeah, look, I think this NC State's just a year younger version of the South Carolina team. Samuel, Thompson, Lambling, Story, Hool, Beasley, they've gone to war before. This NC State's got one year of experience under their belt. This South Carolina's got three or four. They're both teams with really good players everywhere. I'm fascinated by that VCU Penn secondary consolation match that I think we see happening as well. But I agree in a battle between Carolinas, always expect a four, three. I think this match is going to be really, really, uh, this region is going to be really fun. And then best for last in the case of Chris Hallior is going back to your roots here, Florida, new era, Crawford, Riffis, Andrade, Vale, Goodyear, Shelton, the core that made this run what it was, except for you, Lucas Greif, who I see you. I see you at that number four spot. Um, it's a new era for Florida. So many new starters. I think six new starters here this season. And we haven't seen what's his name, who played the lefty, who played six for them. Benetto. Where's Benetto been? I, I didn't see him uh, early in the season, at least thus far. Maybe I'm just missing something. No, but... you missed him. Yeah. He... Yeah. He, he hasn't been playing yet, but. Look, Florida's going to play South Florida first. On the other side of the draw, two teams that want to be top 25 from start to finish this year. Mississippi State, Chris knows well. He said keep an eye out for them this season. SMU, Grant Chen, certainly a program on the rise. A very a lot of players on that roster, even if they still have to figure out where all of the pieces fit. It's a fun region, like because Florida's good I don't know how big the delta is between them, Mississippi State, SMU, even a pretty solid South Florida team, Chris. I'm fascinated to watch the Gators compete this weekend. What are you – I take it away. The floor is yours. Yeah, I'm, th- this is a really interesting region because obviously, you know, the fans are going to know that that Florida lost the entire entire starting lineup, right? I mean, that's so so you got to replace an entire starting lineup. That's that will always be an interesting an interesting task. By the way, I think I said Paul Bonetto because I'll do that until I die. Paul Barreto, Paul Bonetto, Nate Bonetto. It'll it, you, it we're back. That's how you know we're back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Nate, but Nate Bonetto not been seen. Do we see him this weekend? Uh, you know, the the other guy that we that has not been seen for Florida, they had the two late signees up front. The Polish. From yeah. Yep. One of whom uh, I would expect to see, you know, if you look at at, at our I'm going to say it again and you can you can go ah, at the UTRs. But whatever. He's like the top. He's the top UTR guy on, on the team. Uh, but but, is you know, has been, a, I think, a little injured. Are we going to see him? Interesting questions. So th- those are a lot of my questions around the Florida team. Do we see Benetto? Do we see uh, Orlikowski? And if we see him, where do we see him? Because he's never played a college match. They can slide him in the lineup anywhere they want. Um, should be. I mean, look, South Florida lost a, a bunch of guys last year. The, the transfers. The most notably, the one of the more interesting side takes on this weekend might be if Florida wins and Mississippi State wins. The consolation match featuring SMU versus Florida. One of the S, one of the Flor- South Florida transfers is at SMU now, so mm-hmm. he'd get to play the old coach. But uh, um, yeah, South Florida is going to be undermanned. That that's a match Florida wins. Mississippi State versus SMU is a very intriguing match. As you said, I called out. Look out for Mississippi State. A whole bunch of new guys to the roster in transfer. You and Lumsden from Washington in new guys in, in Joyanovic and Benito Sanchez in the lineup uh, to add to what they had. And now a late sign in Michael Navansky, a January guy. It's an, it, they're a deep team. Obviously, you know, coach Chen brings back what he had in, without, obviously no Chakravarti this year, but you've still got Adam Neff. You've got Kumar, the transfer from AM. and You bring in, Muniz Hidalgo from from you know into SMU from South Florida. I'm not sure you know even though they go 
27,000 deep on the roster. <laughs> I'm not sure how deep they really are. I I'll mean, Crawl, Winkler, Neff, Kumar, Munez, Hidal. Like, they've got a lot of players. Like, There's a lot of players. All of those guys were your five and sixes. You feel really good about them there. Yeah, I just, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just not sure. I'm obviously between that and the fact that I'm still, you know, rocking the state shirt. <laughs> well, hell, state, we're gonna, t- we're gonna take Mississippi State in that match, set up an SEC final showdown, Florida, Mississippi State. I, you know, I would love, love to pick my Bulldogs. I can't do it. I mean, I don't know if we see Benetto. I don't know if we see Orlikowski. Grant, look, Grant's been the biggest surprise to me this year. I mean, he had some great results in the in the summer, uh, and he's looked good. He's going to be a, a top. A Neve has to play one for that team. Grant's going to be up there in the top of the lineup. Jonah Braswell, you know, uh, Micah's little brother, has been outstanding as a freshman for the Gators. Uh, Tokach has looked good. Looked that the freshman combination of of Tokach and Nirendorn has been great in doubles giving them that's a spot that's been a sore spot for uh, a few years for Florida. And, you know, doubles was sort of like, well, we don't really have to have it because we can win four singles. Now they need the doubles. I think they've got the pieces there that are going to be enough to come out of this region either way. But I will say that definitely, you know, it's a, it's a match they could lose, but I'll take Florida to win that one. I love it. Folks, that's your look at all 15 of our host sites. Of course, the 16th spot belonging to the University of Illinois, who will host the final site at, I believe, the XS Tennis Club in Chicago come that third weekend in February to quickly run through everything, Chris, because, again, 11 and a half is the over under. Let's go through UVA lock for you. Ohio State lock. Michigan lock. USC lock. Kentucky lock. TCU lock. UNC You're sticking with the Tar Heels, so still no upsets. Wake Forest, you took Duke. That's upset number one. You took Texas in their region. You took A&M, so that's upset number two. You win Florida State. That's upset number three. You pick Georgia. You pick Tennessee. You pick South Carolina. You pick Florida. Chris, you end up with 12 host teams remaining you will take the slightest of overs it's a good thing i took the over no i'll disagree with you i'll take the slight under just so we're on differing sides so we have a uh a little disagreement here to start the show but shout out to me for making that line right 11 and a half feels like just about right um and so again that's the fun of this weekend and folks let us know for those of you who've tuned with us for the duration of this time for those of you listening to this in podcast form of the 15 host sides on the men's side of the 15 on the women's how many do you see advancing to the final sites the ita national indoor championships let us know on social media at crack brackets at al gruskin at college tennis ranks of course a shout out as always to our super producer daniel westoff for the job he does making everything possible not just this show but Again, 18 of the 30 kickoff regions available on our Crack Rackets YouTube channel from Friday to Monday. Coming up this weekend, with all of that said, Chris Helioris, any final thoughts before we wrap this inaugural show? Oh, I no. I my only thoughts are let's get the let's get it going. And it starts Friday, not Saturday. So everybody, if you're tuning in, check the schedules. Friday, everything gets going. A lot of matches on Friday. Uh, family coming in. I'll obviously be at UK. I will hope to pop on and join you at some point uh, over the weekend just to see what's going on everywhere else. But yeah, let's get it rolling. We are ready to rock and roll here at Cracked Rackets. Of course, a shout out as always to our friends at LS. A shout out as always to our friends at Swing Vision. We are proud to have them as partners here on the deciding point throughout the course of this 2023 season. With that said, for our fantastic co-host who you will see week in week out here on this show the professor chris hallioris for our super producer daniel westoff our friends at ls and swing vision and from all of us here at both crack rackets and the tennis channel podcast network i'm your host alex gruskin chris for the first time in 2023 what do we tell our listeners hey great shot and we will see do you miss maddie's echo do you miss it i, I was like wait is it a is it a is it a gsp Yeah, it's good. Well, we will see you all on Friday for this kickoff weekend. Thanks for tuning in, everyone.